Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Hilaritas Podcast with me, your host, Mike Gathers. Join me here and now as we explore the vast world of iconic writer, psychedelic psychologist, rebel philosopher, and self-proclaimed agnostic mystic, Robert Anton Wilson. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. Right here, right now, it is my great pleasure to share with you my chat with raw lucubrator and grill AI ontologist, Vincent Murphy. Vincent Murphy, welcome to Hilaritas Podcast. Very happy to be here, sir. And I'm kind of winging it now in improv mode, but um, I'll, I'll say for introductory purposes, you and I met almost 20 years ago. I don't know when you came on the scene, if you were there from the beginning, but you were at the Maybe Logic Academy with several of us. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And that crew continues on in its own way with uh, Bobby Campbell's Maybe Days. And you were talking uh i guess that was a couple of months ago on the this what, the solstice not the summer solstice the winter uh that's right yeah with the uh uncle jim uh, all about uh uncle jim and finnegan's wake yeah and the tie into that yes and you work today as a as an artificial intelligence consultant is that fair i, I kind of leaped in i i again i think the um the field is so exponentially changing that to even give yourself a job title, the old ones just don't fit. I, I, look, I reach back into the past and I kind of, I, I either say to people, just call me the, the, the AI person or the AI guy or AI monger, whatever you kind of, you know, to, to, to call yourself a consultant or any of that kind of stuff is a kind of throwback to a previous technology and it, 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 it then is kind of wrapped up with the computational side of stuff or it's something to do with IT. And, and it's kind of getting people to grasp this is bigger than this. You know, it's bigger than that idea of it just being a new thing we can bolt on. I mean, you can do that with it. But it, it, it kind of does a disservice to just how big it is, you know, and then how wide ranging it is. Um, I built a, a GPT last week or a couple of weeks back called um, the Electric Monk based on Philip K. Dix in the um, in his Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. He had this idea of uh, that the, 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 the Descartes in the book uh, refers or, or, or keeps in touch with this electric monk he refers to it as. And it's this sort of sentient uh, technological spiritual concept that he can dial himself into. So I thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to build one of those. So now it's there on GPT store. If anybody wants to converse, it's basically a Zen monk combined with Philip K. Dick's philosophies and stuff. So you can talk to it about Zen and Buddhism and the electro and how the how the AI fits in with Buddhist spirituality and stuff. It's that kind of fun. That's the things that I want to do with AI. You know, that's the things that I think is most interesting about it is the possibilities, the creative possibilities. You know. Mm. And and so on, in the maybe log discussion, you had a comparison with LLMs and and Finnegan's Wake, I believe it was, or Joyce in general. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the comparisons, and this is my the sort of why I'd love to see this renaissance in 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 Bob's work and, and all this kind of um, a new upbound and widespread respect for what he was talking about, because the kind of analysis he went into with Finnegan's Wake. So uh, just to give you an idea, I had this dream of one day using Finnegan's Wake in the same way that one uses the, the I Ching as a, as a consultive kind of thing. And I always had this, well, how would you do it? And how would you combine these two things? And AI just opened it up so easily for me to, and it's another GPT I produced called the I Jim, where you consult it in the same way you would consult the I Ching. Um, but it, instead of using the quatrains from 
the I Ching, it uses extracts from Finnegan Wakes and Ulysses and then gives you a forecast and, and a sort of gives you a, uh, a renounce and all that. Um, so, yeah, the more I looked at the, the way LMMs have been produced and that massive switch, which has produced everything we've got now, this, this sudden exponential increase after the AI winter, as it was called, mm. was because of that switch that they switched from that sort of expert learning where they were just trying to cram it with, with all the, the databases, with as much information in order to try and reflect the human knowledge base. And it just it, it got harder and harder for them to, to, to come up with precise definitions. And it was only when they threw that out, and, and for want of a better term, they basically appropriated maybe logic and realized that probabilities was a far better way. And, and then it would start to the algorithms they could use, it would then start to sort itself out. And so just as the, the LLMs inside have a sort of black box capacity, for, you know, it's very hard to figure out exactly how they're doing it, but yet you can peer inside and you can extract data. I just found the very similarities or, or a very interesting analogy with the depth and, 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 and the wonderful esoteric nature of, of Finnegan's Wake that you can, you know, if you, upon reading it, you can extract meaning from it. You can use what, what uh, words it's associated with. You can look at the, you can do the, again, the Ezra Pound thing about, Every word is a fossilized poem. So if you look at these Portman two words, you can extract. And it's very similar to what LLMs are doing about extracting meaning from the data that they're giving and making those connections and, and mm -hmm. in doing all of those connections, which is exactly what I feel Bob was always trying to do at Maybe Logic, which was don't have definitives, you know, constantly being uncertain. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're predicting, but based on uncertainty rather than on absolute finalities. There's a fuzziness. Exactly. The whole thing that, yeah. uh, I don't remember. I remember hearing about fuzzy logic years ago, and I don't remember what the hell that was about. But uh, He was a person on, do you remember? Fuzzy Buddy was one of the... Um, very oh. big yeah one of our contributors a very good friend um uh yeah who's it was a huge contributor and he, he'd sort of grokked and that's why he called himself fuzzy buddy on on the maybe logic academy nick i never yeah. nick nick i never yeah. made the connection of fuzzy yeah. fuzzy is in maybe logic hmm. I was thinking more like a furry, you know, like a fuzzy animal, kind of cuddly. I've been going down the wrong association. Ah, how funny. But the, so, yeah, so it's like we're used to this kind of uh, compu calculator computation, linear and precise. And this brings a whole nother world of fuzziness, the AI hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And and all of those things that make it much more uh, human mm. than the machines we're used to. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's just a real, you know, talk about Bob being. And I think we we've mentioned before that he hated any concept of being a guru or a prophet or what have you. But I think he just turned that startling intellect and just focused it and and it was kind of you know less of prediction more of a probability that this is where we could end up and and it just it's sort of two decades later we're pretty much there you know where, where, where he was all that, that that his his extrapolations and what he felt technology would end up being able to do and our ability to harness that seems to be it's it, it, it sort of played out you know yeah yeah okay this is interesting i haven't because it's Bob kind of talked about internet as a way to bring the maybe logic out. And in our current state of affairs, it's almost more divided us than, than brought us together. But the, the road we're going down here is the fuzziness of artificial intelligence can really draw that maybe that need for maybe logic. And then we'd be living in more of a maybe logic world in a way. And I think, as you said, that that divisive nature, if people adopted, I mean, it's both the, the sort of 
remember he used to mention about the sword of, not the sword of truth and the shield of fact. Oh, I can't remember the analogy he made, but if people were prepared to use the maybe logic capacities or the, 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 the not taking any one particular view as being gospel and you know, basically pretty much everything he wrote in, I think it was that essay, the neurological relativism uh, that he wrote in, yeah, and that sort of just basically lays it out in, in 700 words. But that, um, if people were prepared to, 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 to approach their dealings on the internet like that, again, coming back to when we used to sign off with that mythos that maybe I'm full of shit, Mm -hmm. sign off and, and enjoying the maybe logic thing and we would stop that exactitude and that that sense of i'm in the right you're in the wrong constantly and that and then the tribalism which again bob constantly warned about that the fact that boundaries were what was it boundaries just a place where two two tribes have fought themselves to exhaustion and that's been played out against the backdrop of that uh you know the idea that the microchip absolutely democratize the process of information the internet for all good and bad it democratized the transmission of information and i think ai is where we're going to look at the democratization of the personalization of information if we choose to do so if we choose not to just have it as a bolt-on version of the internet where tribes get more and more concrete or more and more just hiding behind their barriers you know there's something coming up for me around um that the artificial intelligence ai is kind of giving us the average it's giving us the average human at this point in time so to speak as a collect the average collective human hmm. and that that um I got that from Kevin Kelly. Um, hmm. And that um, is, I wonder if that is something that can pull us to the middle where we're faced with all these extremes. Can AI pull us to the middle, to the average and show us the middle? What's the, the excluded middle was the, it was like a publication back hmm. in the seventies, hmm. I think. Hmm. Hmm. Um, no, it's, it's really, I mean, uh, like Bob, I like to sort of try and peek into the nooks and crannies that are the, the as a, as yet unexplored, and uh, I guess slightly coming from a from you know poor Irish immigrants who who settled in the in the UK and having been born around England doing it or the UK during its final. What do they call it? Managed decline. It's retreat from empire, and it, it's finally casting off the last vestiges of, of what was once the you know the largest empire in, in the world had seen for two, you know and ruled for two two centuries. Um, and part of me wonders if we might have to, as humans, do a version of a retreat from empire, the, the holy human empire. We either have to start looking at, well, this empire may not be just ours alone. You know, all, all empires crumble and somebody else can't, or they change dramatically, like the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire and what have you. But our dominion may be coming to an end. And it's whether we decide to fight that or whether we decide to actually manage that as a, de as a decline and say, okay, well, now we have to change our attitude. We have to share this. And therefore, we have to become, I, I, I wrote a, uh, a, 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 an app stroke platform for this idea of uh, increasing the, the level of participation. I mean, mainly or partly in, in the fact that if AI does, if we do the AGI then towards uh, uh, SI, the increase in leisure time is what human beings would do. And I know, you know, there are many of the people, as they say, would, who wish for eternity, who don't know what to do with themselves on a rainy Sunday afternoon. But in terms of the amount of time that human beings will have on their time, what will they, they turn that to do? Now, there is the long list. People like, I'm very happy. Give me as much leisure time as possible so I can read and I can learn and I can do all that. Um, but I do think participation in the way that we lead the way that we, we we interact with one another 
and how would we do that? And and would we have a form of uh, mass participation? We can go down this on a on a separate. But the idea of us being able to AI being able to magnify individual voices. So instead of uh, so at the moment you have a topic and everybody piles in with their comments and it then descends into whatever kind of fractious thing it's going to be. But if, let's say, using AI, you were able to contribute your comments and it would then be able to uh, assess them all and come up with a reasoned response based on all of the input. So it basically conglomerates everything that says, and then, okay, this amount of people have this to say, and this is their this is their take on a thing, and it then adds. You sort of have a collective argument, and that's the problem at the moment. We sort of we're still firing individual arrows at one another, as opposed to having a collective voice. And we're doing it through a funnel of individuals. You know, we find our champions. We find our who's going to speak, you know, who's going to be the person who represents our views best. And it's a very binary and a really old fashioned process that the, the, the concept of democracy, you know, for, for fine and fantastic as it is, but it was developed because people were too busy mining their farms or doing it to actually go and represent themselves. And the idea of a self representative democracy is made far more, they are, they, there are, versions of it around the world that have been tried on small scales. But the ability that AI gives with that personalization of information is a person's ability, if they have the wherewithal to do so, is to, to represent themselves, mm. to be able to actually have their say in the matters and what have you. Um, so it's those kind of things I don't see being, and this is what makes me laugh about, I've seen the declarations on AI from the IMF, from the Davos groups, from the, the, the World Economic Forums, from the UN, from the individual governments, and every one of them, they make incredibly, you know, very, very sensorial, very um, um, full of gravitas uh, declarations, laying out what it's going to be, etc. None of them are looking inwards. Not one of them takes that line of, do you know that, what's it? Okay, I found out what the problem is, and it's me. None of them have said, Do you know, what? maybe we should look at ourselves as this huge top-down hierarchy that has that at the top of the pyramid, as Bob used to call it. You know, with the and and then uh, issuing directives and issuing diktats on how everybody else should be. And we've never had a technology that has allowed that so much to actually be repurposed and redesigned and, and it to be given to individuals to have much more of a say in their in, in their own destiny, so to speak. I know it's speculation, but it's my I feel that is more in what Bob was his hopes mm -hmm. in terms of what the internet would do, what technology could do, that sort of libertarian, social libertarian side, that the individual would have much more say. Obviously at the moment, AI is still within old-fashioned structures you know interesting so one of the ways i've thought about this is is uh and i've just been listening to mark andreessen a lot and and mm. he talks about having an ai assistant mm. so to the extent we all have our you know our ai assistant our cortana our siri that's uh customized for us and knows us and you know or gets to know us and how we operate and think and all that so then the next step as i'm following you is that that ai that understands us could then feed back to um the government let's say and say this is what this person's wishes are or and uh that could all be taken in as a whole and used to guide the ship, so to speak, from like, this is this is kind of the, the de democratic majority says, we want to steer the ship this way. Mm -hmm. Is that? If that that's, that would that, I mean, be nice if the, if the hierarchy itself was flattened, because obviously if, if yeah. you have this power, the, the distributed power of an LLM that anybody can have access to say chat GPT. You see, I think this, again, it's, it's another, big philosophical debate to be had. But 
our systems of power are, are pretty much predicated, especially in sort of democracies, but they are they're still predicated on power being the the um, uh, the, con the, the the concentration of knowledge, so the concentration of of, of information. So mm. somebody gets promoted because they know more about the company and That's more about true. the business than anybody else. You know, they, they might know where the keys are to the filing. They know the history, etc. If everybody has access to the similar thing, then that rationale, and this is, I think it's really interesting for terms of what is happening in the arts, but especially always what's happening in academia, because those places have been our repositories of our knowledge. You know, they've been the kind of, the the, the 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 castles of where we've kept and stored the inside these these cathedrals of knowledge but as that becomes absolutely accessible so even more accessible via uh, not having to do specialist learning and i think i mentioned to you about the doing the the um, robert heinlein 10 the uh, specialization is for insects did i mention that to you Yes. That the so yeah so that that I'm like getting AI to talk me through each one of those things using the new sort of voice activated uh, chat GPT, and you have an infinite an infinitely patient teacher. You know it doesn't care about how how little you know. It will reduce it down to that. It will talk you through. It will never get bored. It will never go or roll his eyes, it will just constantly, t and so in terms of the learning, I watch it with, you know, my, my I, I watch my 10 year old using it. And of course, for him, he's just, that's it now. He has, and it's funny, because he's kind of got in that stage where he loves Alexander the Great. And he was watching the film where Anthony Hopkins played, uh, I don't know, it wasn't Anthony, it was but anyhow, the guy from My Fair Lady, he played Aristotle, as because as as Alexander's teacher, and I was joking. I was like, "You've now got Aristotle as a teacher because that thing that you're chatting to has this incredible wealth of information. It can talk to you about anything, anything, and and will happily talk to you for hours about subjects and stuff." Um, so I think that freeing of you know information wanting to be free uh, just adds a completely of how we how we look at the landscape of. Well, what are these power structures that have happened for the last 2,000 years through necessity? Mm. But are those up for, are those up to be looked at now? And I'm sure AI would look at it in the same way if it start, you know, if it continues on this exponential path, it would look at us and go, that's a little bit primitive that way you've got of the biggest or the angriest person gets to be in charge, you know, or, or you know, that person who's hoarded all the, Right, shiny metal gets to be in charge. Mm, I've come up with this. Oh, speculation. But so this this democratization of information is um, bringing Bob to the masses. That's not the right mm. way to put it, but kind of what Bob's perspective was that that bringing more information to the masses and bringing knowledge and intelligence to to everyone is mm. that. I think so, and I think not to use a, you know, I, I hesitate to use a, a, a military analogy, but my feeling is that at the moment when I talked about the, the WEF and people like that doing their pronouncements, they reminded me nothing more, nothing less than the generals at the beginning of, of World War One who, and you know, they say about generals are always fighting the last war or always want to fight the last war. And because they had concentrated so much supposed power and expertise, that they were allowed to basically try and fight a 20th century war, a mechanized war using 19th century Napoleonic tactics. Mm. So they lined up all these men in a row and had them facing one another and completely refused to acknowledge that the introduction of mechanized warfare, the rifle, the repeating rifle and the machine gun absolutely made that irrelevant as a form. And rather than change their tactics, they dug everybody into a hole and for the next four years, they literally, and then they spent all of their time trying to 
work their way out of an impasse that they had dug themselves into. So the creators of the problem were the worst people in the world to be trying to solve that problem. And I think there's a thing here. I see the same when I see these diktats coming from these huge organizations, that they are attempting to impose 20th century business ideas on what is a 21st century technology and a 21st century way of doing things. And I think, you know, we won't have the similar kind of bloodshed, but an intellectual bloodshed I can see happening. And I already see it with the way that some of the ways they're trying to implement it and people are trying to jump on board with it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a bloodthirsty analogy, but only in terms of, I wanted to say, you know, it, this is a different way of doing things. And it was only when they realized that actually very small autonomous units, people, you know, small groups working together under their own steam who had an awful lot of um, uh, self-agency, et cetera. It's only when they moved the military side onto that, which they do to this day, were they able to break their impasse. And, and in the same way, I don't, it may not just be individuals, but small teams of groups, work, which is why I think the maybe logic sort of was such a fantastic in the beginning because it was a fairly small group of people just absolutely with this cauldron of ideas coming off one another and bob setting out the rules remember his um if you can't agree at least agree to be polite and i've tried to impose that on any if i've ever found myself overseeing any kind of you know community on any base is that you don't have to agree but at least agreed to be polite. And it really worked. It held up from, you know, we had a few couple of you know, moments as that all human beings will have. But, you know, they, that working together and the amount of stuff that came out of that was was an, an absolute idea of what, where the internet could have gone and, and was an idealised version, I guess. <laughs> Ahead of its Sorry. time. <laughs> it really yeah. was, yeah. Well, let's see here. There was something you had written to me about um, things like artificial intelligence and Bitcoin kind of being uh, reimagining what Raw originally envisioned. Mm. And it reminded me kind of the, the Bucky Fuller side of things, this idea that we have abundance, mm. that abundance is finally here. Um, and, and maybe that follows into the William Gibson, you know, the future is here. It just isn't evenly distributed. <laughs> but um, that's what I see coming. Or that's, and that's what I thought of when I read what you, you, you mentioned there. Um, Absolutely. I saw, the, um, I saw a geothermal, uh, a demonstration of a new geothermal power unit, which basically uses common dirt and can be powered as a battery. And it has its, its real field trials are going really well, and it, it, it looks like it could be an amazing breakthrough. And that's that's Bucky in a in a in a nutshell. You know, it doesn't matter. Everything's a resource. It's just whether you know how to how to utilize it. You know, and all you have to do then is utilize it once. That's the hard part. You know, that's where all the money and that's where all the upfront comes from. Once you've done it once, you just have to replicate it. You know, you then just have to replicate it. Um, and so, yeah, his his uh, the, the the idea and synergy, and I'm, I've, I think I've got his full, you know, his his version of uh, it's like a three day talk he gives, and I've got I've got sort of quite a few of his books and stuff, and I, I wrote a book based on um, uh, uh, when you were talking to Scott Apple Appel, and he was talking Appel, and he was talking about um, he used to send Bob all of the Orson Welles interviews that he'd collected. And I, 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 I had one of those where the BBC done this brilliant uh, sit down conversation with Welles for hours and hours, and it's on the BBC website. Mm. And uh, Orson mentions at one point, he said in 1942, uh, because he was doing all the stuff for the war bonds and all of the um, uh, broadcasts, he'd become fairly good friends with FDR and FDR um, said he should go into politics and he refused. He said, uh, and he, he sort of laughed and he said, I really didn't think America would ever vote for a divorced actor, <laughs> a divorced Hollywood actor. And he said, it's a decision I've regretted a lot over the years. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
But if he'd have run, he would have he'd have run in his home states, um, which was which one's the milk one? Which one's the is it not Iowa? Um, whichever his home state is, anyhow. But his home state, he'd have run against a very lacklustre campaign run by a certain Joseph McCarthy. So there'd have been no McCarthy. I mean, if, if Wells had raised his game, and he even says to himself, you know, if I'd have, I was a showman, if I'd have raised my game, I could have you know, wiped the floor with him, you know. Um, the dairy state, whichever one's the dairy state. Um, so he, you know, he said this, you know, what, what how the world could have been, because he, you know, the eyes on the presidency, and he was a massive fan of the United Nations. And stuff. So I wrote this book called O. Wells 198.4, because I got really, you know, Dystopias. If you've if you've walked across one barren wasteland, you've walked across them all. Post-apocalyptic scene. So I wanted to do a not a utopia, but an optopia. So I imagined that Wells had gone into politics and he'd become president and he had you know been this great showman, etc. And so it basically took an alternate view of what could have happened to the world after 1980, after 1946, he would have gone in. Um, and I had to do a sleight of hand, really, and think, well, he's going to have to have somebody really amazing. And I thought, well, okay. So he looked around, and he he made um, Bucky his vice president. And I just had him say, look, if it's got anything to do with words, send it to me. If it's got anything to do with numbers, give it to Bucky. Um, and so what kind? So basically, it accelerated the the idea of of how quickly the world could have adapted using Bucky's concepts of wraparound, electricity sharing, etc., um, and just showing what society would look like now if those two had had carried on and he'd had a double term as president, what have you. And so it was really interesting to try and flesh out what Bucky's world would have looked like. Yeah, would we have reached? And it, the book itself concentrates more on what you do with your discontents if you live in a in, in a kind of virtual paradise. If you live in a post-abundant society, what do you do with those who just refuse to? And, and you know, I put them on the other side of the great barrier of grief in Western Australia. Um, but it was... Um, but it was really interesting because that idea of, of Bucky's just the, the, again the same kind of mind as Raw. You can see why Raw had such a such a time for him because that same sort of intellect that's sparking off of everything and and is just making connections left, right, and centre and putting things together. Because um, he said that Bucky said it had a really good indication about the British Empire and why it was different than all the other empires is that other empires would rapaciously use up their resources and then they would go over the horizon to the next place. So they had to expand or die. Whereas the British Empire had reached a point where because they'd sent out all their navigators, which is why they had such a big thing for scientists and explorers and Darwin and Cook and all these people out there, because they'd mapped the world they were the first people who knew their empire was finite. So then it became a matter of, well, now we have to look at what resources we've got. And that's why they were sending out all the scientists and the geologists and the explorers, etc., because they knew there was boundaries. They knew they'd reached the end of how far they could go. They knew the territories. Now they just needed to take a, a basically a stock take of what they had. And so that that changed the nature of what empires were supposed to do. It's just a real typical. I'd never thought of it like that. Right. But it was it was it was a it was a step change because every other empire was always looking to get across to the next tribe and conquer them. Whereas the British had reached this end and gone, okay, that's it. We've met we've met ourselves coming the other way. <laughs> right. <laughs> now as far what? As we go. Now what? Yeah. And so, so it was, the it was dog really caught the tail and yeah. <laughs> Finally, caught the bus. Yeah. <laughs> so let's. Um, we talked about starting with this, but you had an anecdote around Turner, or I'm sorry, Turing and Shannon. Um, it, another an absolute coincidence. I, I was reading. I'm a huge, again, like Bob, a huge fan of the of of, of Shannon's or, and and Turing's. But um, in 1944. Uh, Shannon was working at Bell's Labs on cryptography, as was Turing. And Turing was sent to New Jersey 
for two months to, to liaise with what was going on over there. And he met up for two months. He would regularly have lunch with Shannon. The two of them would sit there. They were both involved with cryptography, with cryptography, but unfortunately, both of them had signed their respective countries' official secrets act. So whilst they were both working on this huge things of cryptography, they weren't allowed to talk about it. So instead, the two of them spent their time just speculating, and the speculating they came to that, that caught both their imagination was, did they think computers or machines would ever be able to think? And so for two months, you've got these two guys. I mean, I actually wrote to Spell Labs. You know, it's, it's no longer there, and it's turned into this big business park and big fancy housing and stuff. And I wrote to their PR department, and I said, you know, if you ever wanted the ground zero for where AI sort of sprung into, because where these guys went with their ideas, you know, Shannon going off and, and formulating with, with information theory and Turing, with obviously Turing machines and computation, that those I, those speculations those guys had that, that informed that has to be the ground zero of AI. You know, if you were ever looking to put a plaque up with AI was pretty much born here, you know, obviously they went their separate ways, but then they came back together in terms. They met a few times after that. Um, uh, Shannon <laughs> bumped it or came to Manchester to look at Baby, the very first computer. And Turing had his head inside it, and he had some. He was trying to um, make. He realised that you could actually hear it programming, and he was trying to make it have a whistle, or a sorry, a horn that would go off. And basically, he was debugging this, this very world's first computer. So you just got this world's first computer. And they're having to try and debug it and have a way that they can search it for bugs. Um, the Shannon didn't think that would work. But I just thought it was absolutely fascinating that these two guys with, they said, the information theory and the thing, which would be the basis, of, well, it isn't just AI, but, I mean, it's everything that came before it, but would be sitting there and in idle speculation over two months, just sitting there having lunch. And because they weren't allowed to talk about the thing that they were supposed to be or that they were both doing they just got into this idle stuff and it obviously bled into as they as they went forward and 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 you know now here we are talking about ai you know mm. not riveting but interesting i think they're, co they're coincidence yeah. of the two of them bumping into one another and having such a profound effect on the future is is you know, it's like um lenin and bertrand russell having a 40 minute conversation once and I would have loved to be in on that to find out how that went. Yeah. The Bob Wilson interviews Bucky Fuller. Mm. So how do we, there's this lesson from Bob Wilson about maybe logic that we could apply to the AI world, would you say? Absolutely. And not, not just in terms of the, um, the way that if, if you want an understanding of AI, you know, and, and so many people find it, it is a difficult subject to grasp. And it's one of its, it's so unintuitive for most people. And it really strikes at our egos, you know, that idea that something might be not just smart as us, but smarter than us. Um, but also in terms of how we approach with AI going forward, I think there's a real... Uh, I have found it incredibly useful. I found it in, in my own, when I see both the doom mongering and the accelerationists and that being able to, to take a, a Bob's non-subjective uh, um, attitude towards it as a, as a reality and say, okay, well, this is one reality and tomorrow I'll look at it from a different perspective and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just the best way to look at it because it is so exponential and it's the exponential nature i think people really struggle with that just how fast and how quickly this is becoming quick you know smarter than we are and and its abilities and every single i tell people now you, you can't even think of it I, I used to love how bob used to always put different calendar dates 
and he would just choose a calendar from around the world. So he'd choose the Mayan calendar or what have you. Again, just that try and break people out of their, their reality tunnel. Um, but in the same way, I kind of say to people, you have to think of AI differently in terms of where it's got, how it's moving. And I said, the, so for most people, try and think of it in dog years. You know, AI is two weeks in AI is about a quarter in a usual business terms, if not two quarters sometimes. But within two weeks, there are things happening where, you know, every the things that were this absolute staple, the Turing tests, etc., are just being abandoned at a rate of knots at the moment. Um, and so that that idea of there's a flux in everything and everything in flux. Therefore, that state of perpetual surprise, you know, mm. is, is, is by far the best point of view you can adopt. You know, it's the most sanity keeping one. It does seem like we're hitting the inflection point on the jumping Jesus scale, the uh, <laughs> intelligence where it's just going straight up. And I, I say that, and, and then, you know, what was it, a year ago when this all came out and it was a breakthrough, and I know there's a lot happening and I haven't kept up with it, but the publicity seems to have died down a little. Um, I think they might have had to. I saw... Um... Uh, Sam Altman at the Davos and he made a speech and I think I commented at the time and it might have been on a on a on an Anderson thread no, Anderson um, that um, he reminded me of a teenager who's been ordered by his parents to attend a dinner party and told that his leverage to the family car will be taken away if he says anything too controversial, because he was incredibly rowing back on what he said. Mm. Um, but it did seem slightly, slightly developed for his audience, because when I saw the communiques coming out of Davos, the, the best way they do it, do you remember Bob used to talk about fatic conversation and that it's pretty much... Are you okay? I'm okay. Is everything okay with the tribe? Yes, everything's okay with the tribe. Everything's okay with the tribe. And you repeat the mantra to each other in order to, you know, keep everybody in kind of lockstep and not to, to frighten the horses, so to speak. <laughs> um, and I, th I think there's been somewhat is that they kind of realize that an awful lot of people, the, 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 the worrying aspect of it, the doom, -mong the doom mongering and the pessimistic side of stuff is what people would latch on to. And once again, the traditional and sort of mainstream media have absolutely latched onto that side of it. Unbelievably so. You know, for them, if it's that whole if you're not scared, we're not doing our job, is absolutely coming to the fore with almost everything you read about AI. There's so little of it. And you know, part of it is going to be a degree of self-interest because again, everything's up in the air, all of it's up in the air for all of us. You know, there isn't a, which is what I said at the beginning about not giving myself a job title, because I don't think we have any idea what job titles are going to be around as things go on. Mm. I do think the more empathy your job has, the more secure it's going to be. You can say that, I think. Um, but I think that, that, yeah, so the interesting times on, 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 what, on what's happening with it, but it's, constantly trying to remember that the AI we have now, this is the worst it's ever going to be. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this is, the, you know, this is whatever, whatever you pick up and look at, that's as terrible as it is. And it's this kind of shift. And again, I try to do it with clients or when I'm giving a talk and stuff. And I'll say, we, we have to fundamentally change that up until now, it has served us to operate under the big bang model. So, if you're launching a product or if you're doing something, you know, if you've got a piece of work or a piece of art or whatever you're doing, you will spend months researching it, designing it, testing it, etc. And then on a specific date, you will launch it out into the world once it's gone through there. But the move now is, well, why do it that way when you can do this gradual iterative development, which is um, design fast, launch fast, fail fast, you can get it out there and you can keep working on it. You can get feedback off of people and they can say, oh, that's rubbish. You can so easily now with AI 
respond to customers' demands, change it, tweak it, make it better all the time. So do you remember that they used to have that little something? There used to be like a construction signs or it would be a hard hat. And it used to have website under construction was a was a popular one. Yeah, and, yeah. and web designers would come back and say, your website should always be under construction. You know, you should always be making changes to it. And it's kind of AI does the same thing that for look for more and more things but certainly for virtually anything online you should you can just have iterative development so that thing that you launch into the world is yeah this is what i've got so far but i can keep on adding and i can keep mm. on changing that and that's that's a very different mindset for lots of ways of thinking because you're now living in a a permanent state of now it's a, it's an interesting sort of almost buddhist philosophy thing that you are this idea of history and, and future, because uh, in the old way of Big Bang, you do everything in the past, you launch it in the present, and then you wait to see what's going to happen to it in the future, and you hope it's going to succeed. Um, and I, I've sort of slightly, uh, like Bob, I've never been able to give up the, uh, <laughs> I've switched to electronic, but, um, but it used to interest me when people talked about giving up smoking, and they said one of the things it did was it made them live in a stream of consciousness so that if you smoked, you'd have full stops at the end of, so you could do a project, have a full stop, go outside, have a smoke, come back or have a prayer, as they say in France. Um, um, and that kind of gave punctuations to your day. Whereas if you gave up smoking entirely, there isn't that. You don't go outside and play with a fidget spinner. You don't, it's just not something you do. So you, so you learn to live in a, in a state of, of, of perpetual now. Um, and it's kind of similar with the graduative, gradual iterative development, is it allows you to live in a kind of stream of creativity as opposed mm. to a working away on something for years and then unveiling it to the public. And that's kind of a vault change for human beings. You know, that's a different way of looking at the reality. You know, it's, it's tumultuous and scary for some people. So there's this idea of this constantly evolving, um, dynamic, ever-changing thing as opposed to the static or, or maybe what you what I took from what you're describing is like this punctuated equilibrium. Maybe, mm. where you have a change, a massive change, let's call it. And then there's kind of a steady state. And then you have another step change in the steady state. And, the, and what I'm hearing from you is more of a dynamic flowing iterative on top of iterative process. Yeah. Do you remember in the maybe logic and Bob, they, they brilliantly edit where he says in the maybe logic video, DVD, where he says non simultaneous processes interacting. And then he says it in various different ways, interacting processes, non simultaneous. And he constantly says it and he has it. And I, I absolutely concur. I would add just one tiny bit on that, which is I would say in terms of us um, or sentience in, in consciousness is it's non simultaneous problem solving processes interacting. But that idea that he was, I, I feel anyhow, he was saying, all these processes are going on. You just have to tune into them and be aware of them. You know, the plants are growing around you. The electricity is crackling through the thing. It, it's all happening. Just your reality tunnel tunes in or tunes out the bits that it wants to, you know, in order to, to, to form some form of stability. So with the graduated iterative development sort of mindset, you're kind of moving into that more in tune of those processes constantly interacting. And now you don't do it all the time, just as Bob said, you know, you, you take a few stabilities and probabilities that are and and you know in order not to go insane. But in terms of a, a sort of shift in perspective on how we could even begin to catch up or at least maintain some degree of uh simpatico with ai i think we have to form a kind of more almost a i don't know if the opposite of warfare is a cog fair a sort of asymmetric cog fair that we have to accept 
that this thing is going to outgun us, this thing is going to be big enough. But that doesn't mean we can't still play an important part. It's just we have to change what it is that we, what our dynamic is going to be with that system. And the longer we try and hold out and, and not change, the more it's going to be done to us. It will change us. Now, that tool, that whole idea of the McCullum thing of first we shape our tools, then they shape us, well, we have to make sure that, you know, because it will shape us and it will shape us in whatever way it seems fit once, if it reaches that acceleration point, where we haven't adapted to, to make us more simpatico or more in line to how big this thing is. It's interesting. I've got, I, I do think the, um, the eight circuits, I do wonder whether certainly seven and eight, but I do wonder if six, seven and eight are almost AI augmented, that that's in order for those, because, you know, that last, um, paper that the guys from Google um, sent out uh, where it said about having sparks of understanding. So it's got sparks of awareness. So this, this idea that it's already fulfilling some of the concepts of what is needed for AGI. Um, so it's starting to build realities out of the noughts and ones because of the amount of input. So where we flattened all the information into zeros and ones, it's now building them back up again and forming these pictures and these ideas and models. Um, that that idea that that's where the augmentation of, of, of the, 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 the higher circuits, the, the intelligent square that Bob and, and, and Tim used to talk about, that that's where they are because this Google paper they, they put forward their three rationales of things for the future what would it do that's so blind mind you know mind blowing to us and they just gave three examples I'm going to try really hard to find what the third is but the second uh, the, the two that grabbed me was oh so there was um uh, versions of telepathic communication so the fact that we would be able to communicate with each other neurologically you know within a, an easy time frame we would be able to directly communicate and then the second and third was it's uh, they refer to it as its oracular capabilities as in its ability to accurately predict the future would just become better and better and better and the third one which i was made me laugh was uh, animal communication that it's becoming so much the, the translation services they now have with real-time instantation translations and, and seamless instantaneous translations, they're now developing enough information that we'll be communicating with animals on a one-to-one -one basis. And I'm laughing because we've just got a puppy and I've said again to my 10-year-old, <laughs> there's a chance that within five years it's going to be there going, uh, feeding time. I need a walk, guys. Come on, I need a walk. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, those, and again, with the circuit, I remember when one of the circuits was based around animal communication, wasn't it, on their way of, was that a higher form of communication or, you know, the, the, was that a different dynamic? Did they have ways? And I just thought those were really interesting in terms of, well, these could be things that the AI would just go, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, just give it to me. Yeah, I'll do it. You know, the, the, because we think it's beyond our boundaries, it could just sit there and go, yeah, give it to me, I'll, I'll do that for you, you know? <laughs> wow, okay, I'm having to, to wrap <laughs> so, my head around. So what came up for me as you were talking mm. is, is the idea of human-AI relationships mm. and how we're, we're going to be forming a relationship with this thing and um and there's going to be this constant feedback it's going to take feedback from us and change how it shows up and then we're going mm -hmm. to be kind of uh it's going to be elevating our game through its mm. feedback you know it, we're going to be working more productively and and have more leisure time and all that jazz but then you took it up a notch here certainly um, in what I would define as the sixth circuit. So this telepathic mm. communication and animal communication. So kind of this area of nonverbal mm. like intuition, what we kind of would call intuition maybe, or just kind of that extrasensory perception. 
and uh, and somehow AI is going to do this for us. I can see it in a way. I don't know that I can describe. I mean, I can see, you know, the tone of the bark. Mm kind of di dictating mm. what the dog needs. Mm. And some, sometimes I can, uh, you know, hear what my dog wants, and sometimes I just know it wants something, and sometimes yes. I'm, I'm wrong and it's just being annoying. <laughs> or, or I can't figure it out, so I, I label it as annoying. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we're at the point now that, uh, you know, with the whales, that I think with the whales off Norway, where they found out that they are... Um, that they give names to their children and they whisper that the mothers whisper a name into the child's into the, the baby whales and it and it keeps that name for the rest of its life that's how it communicates to, to. Mm. but then they figured out that they go on hunting missions with a set of i think they're called false killer whales are they they're, they're a separate species so they called the full the four things and it's very <laughs> Very, very negative name they got, but they're false killer whales. So I think they're another form of dolphin that they they look like killer whales. But so these are these are separate sort of species, but they team up together during the spawning season or what have you to to hunt together, hmm. and they have their own language, and the pods of the, the the thing they have their language, and they've developed a third language which they use when they're talking to one another in order to talk to the other tribe. And these are all completely, you know, coded and decoded and, and they figure them out. So there's not only the language aspects there, but there is the interspecies communication, the ability to, to, to translate and to find, you know, a, a sort of a version of intellectual symbolism where you can, okay, well, that means that we're going to share that. Um, so again, this is a lot of, of, of the use of, of, of basic algos and basic AI to, to, to correlate the amount of information that comes. But they're up, as far as I'm aware, they're up in the high hundreds now of speech patterns and, 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 and phrases and, and that are used between them. Um, so it isn't that much of a, it, again, this is stuff that if we'd have mentioned this, say 20 years ago, there may be logic, you know, it would have been, late night dorm room bullshit sessions, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would have been just this, let's just idly speak, let's, let's have a smoke and idly speculate about what we think the world is going to be. Um, but these are things that you can now, you know, you mentioned them in public, if the, guy, if the top guys at Google are saying, no, this is extrapolating, this is not fortune telling, this is just saying this is the level of computation or this is the level of, of processing power it will be able to do, it will be able to mirror um, sorry, not Mary, it will be able to, to use. Um, so I, th I really think, I genuinely think Bob would have, apps I think Orson Welles would have loved this. He would have, with the, with the leaps forward in AI filmmaking, and he would have been finally free of the studio system completely. You know, you're looking at a, you're looking at a feature now, I would say by the end of 24, they'll have full length AI features. I, I follow a lot of the, the new developing guys and they're getting, you know, just, just if you look what they could do a few months ago, and because they're learning exponentially, what they can do now is just staggering how fast they're coming on and, and the creativity that's going into creating these. So I would, I would probably guess by the end of this year, we're going to have a first full length AI, you know, watchable, full length AI generated, entirely AI generated movie. And they're not bad, you know, they're, they're pretty good. Some of them are quite spellbinding. Some of them you're kind of watching because it's just, it's amazing watching it. It's like watching a dog perform new tricks. You're like, wow, you can do this thing. But the repercussions, what that could have on the film industry, you know, that, that as, a, as a major competition to that. And if you're able to do things, and I was looking at some budget estimates um, and they were saying, you know, you're talking maybe eight or nine thousand dollars of processing time to produce an entire film on AI. So if you can produce an, an, an entire film on that, so for those creatives like like Orson, who just you know he adored new techniques and stuff, you know just watch anything he did. And I, I did a I did a quick one for a competition. It's terrible. It's on my website, but I I, I did this very quick trailer for a film I imagined where the uh, the grandson of 
uh, uh, Citizen Kane grew up in the uh, uh, in um, Xanadu with a very aging Marion, um, and he himself went on to become an AI filmmaker, um, and he's he's. Uh, obsessed by these two characters, his grandfather, Charles Foster Kane, and this guy who made a film about his grandfather, Orson Welles. So it's just playing with the idea. Um, and I was able to come, I mean, it's, it's, it's shonky. It makes um, Mr. Arcaden look <laughs> fantastic in terms of how terrible the cut it was. But it was, yeah, I was able to do that from sitting at my desk at nine o'clock in the morning and I had it wrapped up by 12 o'clock, uh, and that's everything. That's voiceover. I mean, all I did was write the, the, the voiceover, but the, the you know, AI did the voiceovers and did all of the, the stills and the camera work and all the stuff on it. I called it City Zen Kane, or City Zen Can. Um, but that was just me sitting at home, like, uh, complete and utter, utter, taking the word amateur to its thing. But I just wanted to see what it could do. Um, so in the hands of someone like, you know, a, a genuine, a, a maverick, and this is the thing, that for the mavericks out there, the creative possibilities are going to be, are going to be incredible. Um, so, yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's I'd, I'd rather err on the side of Bob with his constant thing about hooray for the optimists, you know, mm. that, that and, and as they say, was it um what do you do about the pessimists? Well, at some point, they're going to throw themselves out the window, so then they solve the problem for you. <laughs> so, so, um, so, yeah, so, it, it, you know, I, I look on it that, again, with Bob, I think we've spoken about Bob saying that he'd stopped watching the news and instead he was keeping up on technology because he saw that as the way that humans would make the most changes and that's what would do our, as Bucky said, it's technology that does it. Um, so I try to I try to maintain that course that we get there, you know. But yeah. the future, you know, the f was it the future's never never quite as bright as the um, as the optimists would like, and never quite as bad as the pessimists hope for. So, <laughs> I I personally got in some uh, pushback because I I posted on the the Bob Facebook group that politics was completely irrelevant. <laughs> um, based based on my feeling that technology drives progress and that politics is reactionary, and mm. um, I still believe that pretty firmly. I, I prefer to follow technology and see where this is going. And um, I forgot where I'm going with this ramble I'm on right now. But but optimism, I believe, was a, a big message of Bob's. It's overlooked. I used to talk to a friend of mine about these things and like he's where does he get all this you know because a lot of his future predictions were just so over the top and that mm. my friend this is michael johnson was like well bob was really uh pushing hope i think and and the you know the post for somebody mm. that was born into the depression and then kind of grew up in the the cold war and world war ii and everything else he was pushing that message of hope and and the midst of the cold war i guess you could say mm. at that point mm. um, so mm. i i do appreciate that message of optimism it's just well, no sorry sorry Mark. no no go i was gonna say i was just gonna ask for your, your feedback there absolutely i can't i, I mean I, I am not you know my background is working with street homeless people and refugees and in uh, victims of domestic violence and i've worked in children's homes around the world in sri lanka and i am acutely aware of the suffering my, my mm. uh, i did a very deep 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 into i found the the, the, the form of uh, i was really interested in bob's uh, interest in in buddhism and like a lot of you know my a lot of the paths I followed, it's because Bob went off first and slashed a lot of paths away and then went, come and come and follow. So I did with Wells and I did with Joyce and I did with Bucky and I did with Shannon. But I also did it with Buddhism. And I, I really did a deep dive and I ended up becoming the um, chair of governors of the only Buddhist school in, in Europe. Unfortunately, COVID managed to wipe it out. But I did end up managing to sell a building and give a million pounds to a, to a Theravadan monastery, even though they're not allowed to handle money, but hey, go figure. Um, but I, I, 
I was really interested. And then with Buddhism, I was more interested in the philosophy rather than the religious, uh, the sort of appreciations, the cultural appreciations. And so I, I studied a lot. And then I found the, the Buddhism, which has the most resonance and the closest to its origins, is the Theravadan Buddhism of um, uh, practice in Thailand and in, in Burma, um, in Myanmar, as is now. Um, so these are the Thai forest monks, and there's a character there called Ajahn Chah, and he's probably the closest you'll get to that idea of a guy sitting cross-legged on top of a mountain and being here. So he was a Thai forest monk, and it was he in the late 60s, they build these kutis because they live out in the middle of the forest and they have lives of absolute asceticism. They don't touch money. They, they have one meal a day. You never eat after 12 o'clock. Um, you don't you know, and so incredible. You own five items in your life and you spend six, seven hours a day meditating. Um, so very, very austere and very, very pure forms of Buddhism, right back to basics. And he said, build these kutis, these huts, and they were building new ones. And he said, no, you're going to have to make them two foot taller. And they were like, why? You know, Thai people are not naturally the tallest people in the world. They're not Dutch, you know, they're quite... And he said, no, there's going to be an influx of, of uh, tall people very soon. And it was all the guys from... Uh, it was the, the guys who were absconding or had left after Vietnam, which, became uh, had been tours of duty in Vietnam. But it was also the Jack Cornfields and the um, um, Joseph Goldstein and those who, who then transferred to the, the sort of modern versions of Buddhism, modern version, but the, the, the insight to Buddhism. But they put a kind of spin on it and it was interesting, but I really wanted to get into the absolute, you know, the core of, of how it worked and the, the very... Um, and that, that absolute basis of wisdom and compassion and that ultimately, um, you know, there's no self, there's no, uh, just just the, the three attachments and what have you. And then I found out that they have a word, which is Ajahn Chah, this incredible monk, and he would say all the time to these people who came to, to, to study at the monastery and to live at the monastery for years and years, and he would say to them all the time, Mai Tai, Mai Tai. And it was like, and then I looked up what it's, and it's maybe, maybe. <laughs> and his constant refrain was, and it was, don't be certain of anything. That's what, and it was this absolute core of the original message of Buddhism was that certainty is what it gets you. Once you're certain of something, you're giving it a name, you're giving it a shape, you're giving it a thing. And that doesn't exist. You know, the, the universe is impersonal, imperfect, uh, and it's impersonal, imperfect, and in, in Pure in, in probably. I know I should know I should know it off my heart. You think after all these years, um, but yes. So that telling all of them, no, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe was a constant refrain. So these these two, any these two figures, these two who have been probably the greatest in terms of my sort of spiritual development. Both had that refrain at their absolute core, which was maybe, maybe doubt, doubt, you know, doubt, doubt some more. Don't take it as a certain, you know, it's not, it's, there's nothing certain. You can do probabilities, but not certainty. Um, so, yeah, so it was an interesting deep dive by way of Bob that it kind of chimed. And this is what, when people say about, Oh, hey, I might develop, a, you know, it, it could develop a consciousness and, and could it? And what it could do, it could also turn out to be Buddhist. It could turn around and go, I don't think consciousness exists. It's a, it's an illusion, you know? <laughs> and mm. So we t we, we're looking at it and again, we're framing it from a very, very Western perspective on what it's going to mean by it having a consciousness and it having an ego and stuff. Whereas, for the one and a 1.4 billion Buddhists, they don't see the world like that. You know, they see it as, you know, the the the, the conscious. The whole point of consciousness is, if you study hard enough, you find out it's illusory. You know, um, but there you go. So, I'm really pissed off now. Go on. <laughs> it's impersonal, imperfect, and impermanent. My impermanent. God, how did I forget there impermanence? Flip the now. Yes. There you have so, it. There you go. Yes. And there's something, so 
it's this idea that, especially in this highly polarized world, that uncertainty brings us to a place in the middle. Which exactly. Is what, I, what I'm I'm grooving on right now, mm. and mm. Um, and by teaching us how to find that place in the middle, it makes it easier. And there's something about that 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 place in the middle is uncertain, so it's kind of high anxiety, mm. but or it can be. And by using these methods of maybe logic to find the the uncertain middle, we're also sort of inoculated against the anxiety around being in the middle. Absolutely spot on. I really think it's the, uh, again, you know, I'm not reiterating Bob, but that not giving definitive answers, but for the sense of peace that it brings for future proofing yourself against the flux and everything and everything in flux to understand that once you have appreciated that sense of impermanence, imperfection and impersonal, um, there's like that, that concept in Buddhism about they say that um, the doors to the deathless are open. And I, I could never get my head around what that meant. And it took a long time of quite a lot of sort of meditation and stuff to get. But it was, of course, because if everything is impersonal, imperfect and impermanent, then there's no ego to die. There's nothing there. And that, that, that sort of popular refrain about uh, ego is, is in, uh, enlightenment is ego's biggest disappointment. And so that, that idea that once you, if that's thrown into the mix, if that is how you can see that all things are, are impermanent anyhow, then the fear of things changing is that everything changes all the time anyhow, that you're, you're part of the turbulence, you're part of the process of the constant change and the constant iteration of things because you're iterating as you are. And it's that kind of just leaning into that idea just adds and gives you that sense of perspective on it, on feeling more comfortable on it happening. It doesn't seem like such a big thing because it's, it's, it's what's happening all the time anyhow, you know? Mm. Oh my God, I'm sounding like, the kind of guru Bob warned us against. I'm Perfect. sitting here pontificating about <laughs> waffling away. No, <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. So tell me, I mean, so uh, this feels Bitcoin. like a good place to wrap it up here, but is there some other direction you want to head or anything else you want to cover? No, I, I, I share your thoughts on, on Bitcoin. Is I, I felt Bob was really... Um, you know, he, he would often talk about the, when he used to talk about the script and the hemp and the different forms of currency, mm. et cetera. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I bought into it as a, as a, as a, I think I wanted to try and be, was it Thales, the philosopher who wanted to prove that philosophy wasn't useless. So he bought up all of the grapes when he realized that there was going to be a, yeah, hard, or he bought up all the wine presses when he realised there was going to be a massive grape harvest, something like that. Anyway. Um, but also, the, the reason I sort of bought bought them very, very early was because of that. They, it just seemed to me this was the one I'd seen other. I'd seen other ones that had tiny little versions. There was a Dutch thing that tried to start up and stuff, micro payment systems. But this one seemed to genuinely fulfil what Bob's thing about it, the decentralization of it, it not needing the magic wand that passed over it to give it value, that it would be set by markets, etc. So it has surprised me. I mean, again, part of it being seen to be co-opted by the um, crypto bros etc., was because we kind of let it happen. We didn't, you know, stake a claim in it or not enough of a stake to claim in it and say, no, this is a... There's a there's a value in this. There's a real value of a decentralized currency to 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 to, to remove the power of the state. If you are genuinely into that, how do you stop oppressive regimes and what have you? And so I was I was kind of surprised that the anti or a lot of the anti that springs up around it from people I would think were 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 adherents to Bob's you know, knowledge and understanding and stuff. So I find it very interesting, you know. That's uh yeah well we talked about this offline but mm. I I think there's a few things 
it's being associated like as an investment. It's a highly volatile instrument and, and you know, it goes up like crazy and then it mm. crashes like crazy. But I think that it gets associated with scams and things mm. like that. Mm. So you have that association. I think you have this thing where the progressive uh, left has this kind of anti-tech, anti-billionaire, whatever bias. So they, they kind of write it off. But what what strikes me is if you strip away like the Bitcoin part and, you know, I can buy myself a Bitcoin and hope it goes up kind of thing. And you look at it, it's a it's a decentralized money network. Mm. Um, and well, I got to gather my thoughts here. But it, 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 the thing one of the things that gives the state the power is they print the money. Hmm. And they continue to print money and then that, you know, they print more money than than before. And that gives us inflation, which is what we're starting to deal with on a global scale now. And hmm. but they have control of the money, whereas this hmm. is a, a fixed supply or a fixed issuance, a fixed supply. It's it's so that side is taken care of by this decentralized network. That's that's pretty uh, I won't say it's completely bulletproof, but it's pretty bulletproof. Hmm. And when you look at all these innovations, you know, we've had this internet innovation, but we really haven't, you know, we've brought some of the stuff from banking onto the internet, but it's still running on 1950s technology, 1950s software underneath it all. Mm. Visa takes a 3% cut every time you swipe it. You yeah. know, you do a, 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 a big money transaction going overseas and you have to go through all kinds of hoops and, and, and clearing houses and yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of friction that doesn't need to be mm. there. Mm. And, uh, so when you remove the state and when you remove the third parties, then it becomes, uh, kind of this one-to-one, -one, if I want to transact with, with you, it goes from me to you without all these third parties, it becomes more of a relational transaction. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of promise there. I, I, I've sort of lost some of my enthusiasm that, mm -hmm. I, that I had earlier, mm -hmm. but um, like all things, I get excited about it up front and I learn about it and then I kind of forget about it. But, uh, you know, with all this talk about the, the state and its tyranny, um, this really takes the power right out from under it. And, Absolutely. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting. Go ahead. Well, this is my, my thing was the, um, uh, when they talk about billionaires having a few money, you know, that, that because they can, because they've reached the point where they've got a, a separate a sense of income where they can say a few to whatever they want to do. And so it was that power of giving that to individuals that I saw as the thing that whilst you are controlled by a state, mm -hmm. you can only dissent to a certain extent but you don't have complete autonomy. But what really sealed it for me more than anything else was the origins of the word bankrupt. So in the beginning, in the marketplaces, in the Renaissance things, everybody went to the local market and in the corner would be the money changer and he'd have his scales and he'd be at his table and you would go there. Now, if he was caught with his finger on the table, if he was shortchanging, if he was clipping, if he was doing anything, the rest of the market would get together and they would smash his table in front of everybody. And bank, Italian for like banqueting, bank means a table, and rupta, rupture, break. Ah. So bank, they would break his table in front of everybody to say, this guy is, is stiffing us. So at that point, the bank was in the town square just as like the ledger of Bitcoin is. Yeah, it's publicly accessible to anybody. But what the biggest hallucination that the state did is the banks decided to go out of the square and in behind closed doors. And as soon as they did that, they became a closed system. They became a black box. You relied on them having that money there. You relied on, you then had to put trust rather than trust but verify rather than having them on that table so the moment they disappeared was the moment banks started to take their you know it was it was no longer an even game and so my feeling was that my thing for a publicly accessible ledger as they have in bitcoin available to everybody 
is it brings back the the idea of the bank of being able to break the tables of somebody who is trying to stiff the system, and that to me is what it was. You know, was the underlying thing to bring it back to what it was supposed to be a fair rate of exchange of goods or services that everybody was able to. And if they did, if they did try and pip you or rip you off or scam you, everybody else would go around and just break their table and chase them out of town, you know? So it was that. That was a big thing for me. Mm. Uh, it's potential, you know? But as you said, the overlaying side of it, there's a lot of foobar in amongst it, I must admit. It's, it's um, I mean, what I hear there is there's going to be more transparency Mm. So, th so that gives us more access into what's mm. really happening besides kind of these black boxes of, mm. of you know, the, the Federal Reserve Bank mm. and, and so on and so forth. Mm. Even going back to the FU money piece, I mm. saw, I, I did, so, the you know, Bitcoin goes up in these cycles where it jumps up like 10x and then it pulls back, you know, 8x. And we're kind of in the early innings of another 10x rally perhaps here. And uh, the speculation was that, you know, at the end of this 10x rally, we're going to have a certain percentage of the Bitcoin or the billionaires in the world will be Bitcoin billionaires. Mm. And these are people that are tend to be motivated to change the world. They tend to be very libertarian and uh, mm. they will, have, you know, so, so the idea is that we could see a lot of. Uh, interesting things happen with people that are suddenly uh, very wealthy and looking to, to change the world in, in, in a kind of a positive libertarian way. Mm. We'll mm. see. Mm. Um, but even when you look at we live in this deflation or this inflationary world where even on a steady state where we're, you know, where we've been for the last 40 years versus where we've been for the last two, where there's just kind of a little bit of inflation. Mm. And so for the for the folks that have debt, you're slowly inflating their debt away. And and that kind of works for an economy. But when you have a deflationary monetary system like Bitcoin, that completely un unends the whole credit environment. Mm. Um, because mm. if if you're in deflation, then your your debt is becoming more of a drag on you instead mm. of mm. Inst um, mm. so it just it's a whole new paradigm. It's like AI, you know, it's, mm. it's going to create a whole new paradigm. And you start linking automation and AI and cryptocurrency yeah. with, uh, you know, just kind of the, the autonomy that we're starting to get through yeah. battery technology and drones and electric yeah. cars and electric this and that. It's um, we, got, we got the second wave of um, the Chinese middle class. So in the, in the last, is it in the last 10 years? 10, 12 years. So 560 million Chinese have gone from pretty much uh, lower working class to middle class with all the aspirations that go with it. So all of the houses, cars, they've got all of those, they've got all the stuff. And I was in Sri Lanka and the, just the amount of Chinese uh, um, big construction works going on and huge just building highways and stuff and they're building an independent port there to link up the, um, the string of pearls they call it all across the world and I was chatting to a, a sort of economist in the know about it and he said well that's the next thing he said um, the Sri Lanka is the China's version of the Caribbean because it's a rice-based culture, but it's far enough away so the cuisine, etc., is exotic, but not completely differentiated. Mm. And the next thing for all of the middle class is now they've got their houses, now they've got their cars, and is foreign holidays, big exotic foreign holidays. And so this, this is a huge swathe. I mean, that is the entire population of Europe going from pretty much subsistence, maybe factory worker, to middle class in less than a decade. I mean, that is, that's an enormously big, as you said, the, 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 you know, with all the automation stuff that comes in it, with AI, the worst, you know, that 10% of all jobs are made redundant, 50% at least will be augmented by AI. We're in for, again, it's gonna be a disruptive, I, well, yeah, I think I said this before, I, don't, I tell people disruption is when the unknown comes to you. 
Mm. Expedition is when you go out into the unknown, when you choose to do the unknown. So look at AI as an expedition because then you've got a sense of agency over it rather than mm. disruption that's coming your way. But the expeditionary nature of AI, it's going to be continued change, you know? I like that little empowering twist on the whole thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, turn it into an expedition. Should we use that as my sign-off? I you think might, that is a to. fantastic place <laughs> to close here. I will uh, put all your goodies in the show notes. Um, you, you mentioned some different apps and websites. We'll get, I'll get those from you later. Yeah, yeah just the vincentmurphy.co.uk is I, I try and store everything on there it's got all the okay. links and stuff so yes it's fairly easy to but i really enjoyed this i hope we can do this again i could i could happily make this a regular yeah <laughs> ask me the time and i'll build you a clock you know <laughs> well i re really enjoyed chatting with you vincent so thank you um thank you're, you for your time well you're very very welcome and i really as i said i think it's uh it's time to maybe chip some of Raw out of the amber he's been caught in and, and toss him into the 21st century because he is by far the philosopher of the 21st century. Mm. I feel absolutely in terms of the practical nature of it and his the maybe logic is just perfect. Yes. I will stop. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Have yourself a good evening. You too. That concludes the episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to Vincent Murphy for taking the time to chat. Thank you as always to Christina Pearson of the Robert Anton Wilson Trust, Richard Rossa of Hilaritas Press. Joseph Matheny will be my guest on the next episode releasing on the 23rd of March as we anticipate the Hilaritas Press release of Bob's Reality is What You Can Get Away With. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor Eheleritas. Eheleritas.